So thank you again for the introduction. Uh, just briefly, uh, my name is Eric Pupo. I'm the Managing Director for Healthcare Technology Consulting at Accenture, uh, also our healthcare blockchain lead. Uh, and today's topic, uh, blockchain for the pharma supply chain, uh, something very dear to my heart uh, as we work in this area. I know IBM, others, uh, supply chain certainly in terms of blockchain big area of focus. I'd like to just briefly ask each of you to introduce yourself so everybody has a good understanding of who you are. Sure. My name is uh, Tim Mackey. I'm an associate professor at uh, UC San Diego in the School of Medicine. I'm also the director of the Global Health Policy Institute, and my background is primarily in public health. I'm looking at blockchain from, a, again, the supply chain perspective. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Treshak with IBM. You may recognize me from a few minutes ago when I was on the previous panel. Uh, I tried to change blazers before they came out, but <laughs> didn't manage to pull that off. So I'm in IBM's global consulting group, focused on healthcare and life sciences, and within that, focused on blockchain and the Internet of Things. My name is Pat Kennedy. I'm substituting for Bill O'Connell, who um, is at another conference. Um, I'm the CEO of Cybercar. Cybercar pre creates a membrane of trust between vehicles, cargo, passengers, and the blockchain, so we're um, predominantly a transport uh, blockchain uh, business. Excellent. Um, so first of all, it, does everyone know what the DSCSA is? Anybody is like, what is, no idea? Tim, do you mind just taking a minute just to describe sure, what that so is, what the requirements are? Absolutely, so the Drug Supply Chain Security Act is a piece of legislation that's relatively new that's meant to uh, create an interoper interoperable um, supply chain for pharmaceuticals. Uh, and that generally means that the medicine should be able to be tracked and traced all the way from its production into where it goes to, to be dispensed. And the utility of that is, of course, that you would have you know, visibility to the supply chain across different partners, and the FDA would have visibility to it as well. And that would more effect, uh, better effectuate recalls and also um, events such as counterfeit medicines that are detected in the supply chain. So that's kind of the general con components of it, but it does require some standard setting. There's a 10-year time frame. We're about two or three years in, I think. Yeah. So uh, there is an implementation phase component to it, so it's not going to be implemented right away, but it is a way to modernize the, the drug supply chain as we know it. Excellent. And I was going to ask you, I, I know, Bill, with, with you working in the, the vehicle, autonomous vehicle space, um, what your thoughts were in terms of potential for applying blockchain to the overall supply chain, what you're seeing in the automotive market right now? Um, sure. So the automotive market? Yeah. Um, of the three categories that we are addressing, fleet, insurance, paramet parametric insurance, and OEMs, the OEMs are probably two to three years out, but we have some significant value propositions from them adding blockchain to vehicles coming off the assembly line and generating revenue off of that attested information. Um, the market that we're focusing, focusing on right now is uh, fleets, and we have two pilots in action, one uh, in the cannabis business, which is a regulated good, and another one which is a proprietary uh, client. But um, we have uh, this membrane of trust between the vehicle and the blockchain, so there's a lot of pharmaceutical um, interest on what we're doing, and we're probably the only people at the present time specializing in vehicles to the blockchain. So, mm -hmm. um, What do you see as some of the issues in terms of trust right now with blockchain? Uh, what do I see with issues related to blockchain and trust? Yeah. Uh, what's the uptake? How are people accepting oh, right now? It's a fabulous solution in particular for state governments who are trying okay. to regulate. As I said, we have one of, one, one of our two pilots in cannabis and the state governments are pulling their hair out because there's a lot of inventory missing mm -hmm. between what they call the grow houses and the dispensaries. Um, so they are I can, looking I can for guess us. What happened to it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, up in smoke. Yeah. As the, um, so they are looking at us to attest to the vehicle information, where it is, what its stops are, driver information, and of course cargo on and off. Um, so encouraging so far. Good. Good. Mark, what do you see right now in terms of uh, implications in, in blockchain? I know IBM is doing several projects in this area. Yeah, yeah, certainly DSCSA is one, but we see this going broader. So if you think about what happens before the DSCSA process, the track and trace process picks up, 
you have the actual manufacturing of the pharmaceutical. So API monitoring, active pharmaceutical ingredient, where you'd go from raw materials that come in that make up the medicine or the drugs essentially and end at the finished product, which is when the track and trace process picks up. And we certainly see track and trace, but then we also see interest around controlled substances. So CSOS, right? Particularly, and I mentioned this in the previous panel, there's a lot of focus right now around controlling controlled substances uh, and how blockchain can be used to better at least manage the supply portion of that problem. Yeah, so there's, yeah. there's lots of implications for this. And if That's I could good. say one more Absolutely. thing real quickly, it's, it's, it's a very interesting case study with uh, the pharma supply chain in that the Drug Supply Chain Security Act actually maps very well to blockchain technology as far as what it requires, which is very atypical for legislation. It's usually yeah. legislation has to react to emerging technology. And that's not, the DSCSA wasn't designed for blockchain. It was designed for more legacy technologies like serialization and barcoding. But it just happens to be that the framework is very robust for a new solution. So a lot of entities are trying to map to it to show that blockchain is a better solution than a lot of these uh, original technologies that were being envisioned for the DSCSA, and that's kind of the, the hard translational component that's going on right now with FDA and a lot of other organizations that are trying to model how blockchain could work for this legislation. Do mm. you see a lot of uh, parallels to public health, syndromic surveillance, uh, how they, they work in terms of disease? Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting, you know, parallel that you could bridge. Of course, a lot of the use cases that even some companies are using about are about how to fight fake medicines, things yeah. like that. But it's really about the design of the blockchain and whether it's going to be public, private, or consortium-based. And a lot of that has to do with what information is being is, is the, the participants are willing to share on the blockchain. From the conversations going on now with a lot of the use cases and a lot of the pilot projects that are going on, it seems like there's going to be a lot less information being shared, and it's really going to be more about uh, creating some, somewhat of a more verified audit log of where the medicines are going, but not providing a whole lot of transparency to what's going on in the supply chain, which is uh, unfortunate to a certain extent because if you had all that data and you could mine it for supply chain anomalies and supply chain optimization, mm. you could get a lot of really good data about where the, the bottlenecks are in the supply chain, such as with drug shortages, mm -hmm. such as potential adverse events. And you could really layer a lot of data on top of that and use things like machine learning and deep learning mm -hmm. uh, to kind of figure out what's going on. But I'm not sure if that's the direction we're going. So that would be a move away from public health and more a move mm -hmm. towards supply chain logistics. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the analytics side? Because I know you, you had a oh. good point there. Yeah, yeah, so around the data sharing, what we're seeing or what we're advocating is that Sharing should be situational, mm -hmm. right? So there's a base scenario where, you know, a supply chain entity could typically see one up and one down, yeah. right? Where something came from and where it went, right? And nothing beyond that. And that's sort of the steady state where we are now. But there are situations where you'd want it to go beyond that. So a drug recall. So I spoke about API, active pharmaceutical ingredient. That ties in with track and trace. So you'd be able to know you have this gallon of substance that is contaminated, and by linking these two things together, you could say this gallon of substance went into these 500 sellable units of medicine, which were distributed to this many pharmacies and you know, this population of people. Now, is that something that you would be able to see at any time, any party? No, but there would be some protocol. Mm -hmm. It's an emergent situation or an emergency situation so some emergency protocol that you can break be the glass almost. Yeah, yeah, that would give you access for mm -hmm. to initiate a drug recall, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. smart contracts could be used to validate that. Right, so you enter into this state, this recall state or emergency state, and the smart contract expands mm -hmm. and gives you permission or gives one permission to access this. Yeah, yeah, I've certainly seen with uh, large pharma a strong interest on the drug recall side. Because right. their, their current drug recall processes are very manual, um, very difficult to, to actually hunt down and find oh, yeah. um, where a drug is, where, who where used it. it. Um, so they've looked at it as if we can provide some type of, of distributed database, like a blockchain, um, where we can send alerts out through that uh, directly to anybody that's actually been registered as part of that blockchain network. Yeah. Um, and nobody sees anybody else who's, who's been using the drug, so it does deal certainly with the, the patient privacy uh, concern. Um, there, there's actually several pilots that have already been developed in that space that we've, we've worked on, so very good, very good. 
Um, I, I had a question for you, Bill, because I know we have a lot of startups here. So what are your thoughts in terms of uh, startups working in the supply chain space? You know, uh, certainly many of the companies here are obviously blockchain <coughs> startup companies. What are your thoughts in terms of, of, of uh, things that they need to look for? How, how, what's it like to work in terms of supply chain uh, vendor? Uh, well, the good news for us is that we've had very eager um, customers because of this issue of regulated goods. Um, so the hottest market for us is regulated goods. We've got some cold transport clients, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a backlog right now of pilots, and we've just got two pilots, which we're going to test, and then probably in a month or two we'll add. Um, but the, um, the industry for us is we're a minor player in, in a big cog. I mean, I, IBM, you know, obviously has the back end and probably the, the front end. We have an intermediate role, which is just the transport of it. So we would obviously need to cooperate with the likes of IBM and others. Um, so that's our role in the supply chain. Some of the other supply chain opportunities have to do with um, high value cargo, et cetera, et cetera. So, Right now, the good news is the regulated good market is the hottest with us, but we're new. Um, what I would say about blockchain in a startup is it's a very fat protocol. There's a lot of work to do. I don't know if I would start it all over again, but now that I'm two-thirds of the way through it, I think um, we're going to finish the course. But it's not for the faint of heart because there, it's just a lot of work to um, build a fat protocol. Mm -hmm. What are some of those challenges looking like? that might be applicable in the healthcare space. Um, and I would ask you, Mark, too. I know you, you do a lot of development in the space also. So all the bias we're seeing is towards permission blockchain. No, okay. not, no public blockchain at all interest as far as our clients. They all want private uh, information. So we have to learn what they're looking for. Um, there's a lot of customization. Uh, we're running on Ethereum right now. We're looking at um, Hyperledger, Tendermint, um, so there's a lot of decision making and some of it's gonna be driven by the clients. Um, we're trying to create a, a bit of a standard package to keep it efficient right now, but it's, uh, it's the wild west. Mm. It's a lot of fun. I think it's gonna, it's gonna stick and um, as Tim said, it maps beautifully to a lot of government regulations that are, we see in the state cannabis business and of course on the federal side with some regulated drugs. Yeah. So what about you, Mark? What do you think in terms of some of those technical issues? Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the technical issues we see are just around the efficacy of the technology and its ability to scale. In life sciences and pharma, the, the privacy becomes a key component. So again, going back to the supply chain example, you know, making sure that uh, only parties uh, who are supposed to see a piece of data in the supply chain can see it and validating that. Um, but then the, the challenges that I think are not, uh, the challenges that are most vexing are not technical. They're they're more along the governance or business side. So these things work best when they explode in the consortiums. So how do you get that going? Right? How do you start a consortium? Uh, how do you, you know, get the base number of companies, participants interested and, and in moving? And that's, that's proving to be the most challenging. And we hope that with the Food Safety Consortium mm -hmm. that IBM is, is building with Walmart and some others, five companies now, that that will give us a model, right, to go forward, and you know it will prove the effectiveness of this technology, and others in this industry will follow. We will want yeah. to follow. Any policy concerns that you see, Tim? Or with yeah, blockchain? so I think I'll just provide an interesting story okay. about it, maybe if that Great. helps. Um, so uh, recently, a joint venture was announced by Chronicle, uh, Chronicle, sorry, and uh, Link Labs to do something called Meta Ledger. And it's going to be like a blockchain for pharmaceutical, you know, governance and also track and trace. Mm -hmm. And it, one of the use cases they there's provided nobody from Chronicle here, right? It's okay. Was right. was to detect counterfeit medicines. Okay. And what was interesting in the press release was a one company that was there, and that was Genentech Roche. And yeah. the reason why that's interesting is because in, in you know about uh, I think it's been about seven eight years I forget. Um, there was a drug called Avastin, which is an anti-cancer drug, a very mm -hmm. expensive anti-cancer drug, that was detected in the U.S. supply chain as counterfeited. The FDA sent out about, uh, um, let's see, 1,972 notices or so to physicians all around the country, indicating that they have, may have purchased a counterfeit vial of Avastin that was, in fact, cornstarch and acetone. 
but had no active pharmaceutical ingredient in it. So to this day, we've written about three papers on it, um, published in the peer review. We don't know how many patients were impacted because we don't have traceability of that product. Of course, that product is in the gray market, so whether the blockchain could help facilitate detection of gray market products, which is not typically in this controlled supply chain, mm -hmm. is a separate question. But the fact that Genentech Roche is interested in this issue and looking at blockchain for that shows that they are interested in blockchain beyond the compliance component and maybe talking about it from a risk mitigation perspective. Um, and because the DSCSA actually requires manufacturers to proactively notify the FDA when they detect a counterfeit medicine, that's another level of what I would say regulatory burden to a certain extent there is on these pharmaceutical manufacturers. And what I think they're trying to do is balance what, you know, what is cost-effective compliance which with what is innovative compliance that can bring them value add in other spaces. And that's why I think the discussion about recalls, about prescription drug abuse, maybe mirroring that with prescription drug monitoring programs, PDMPs, that's where the value add is. It's not just in the compliance component, but it's in these other spaces. Yeah. So here's, here's another example with the, uh, the um, controlled substances. We typically talk about uh, monitoring for supply chain movements from left to right, from beginning to end. But in controlled substances, there's a case to be made for horizontal transparency, I'll say. So, and, and this may be something that's the purview of the government, of an oversight agency. So you could look at, instead of looking at it from left to right, you could look at it, let's say, across all distributors or all wholesalers to see across all wholesalers what dispensaries are they shipping controlled substances to? Mm -hmm. There was a case recently where some tiny pharmacy in West Virginia, I believe, got millions and millions of opioids yeah. mm -hmm. uh, by kind of playing the loopholes in the system. Mm -hmm. right? So that would be a fantastic example. Now, obviously, all the distributors aren't going to share all this information with each other. It would be disruptive to their business model. But yet, doing so would, would solve a public health crisis. So maybe that's an example where the government or an oversight agency could pull that report together Right, to try to get ahead of these. You, you've of done a partnership with FDA, right? In terms yes. of using Watson and um, how's that going so far? It's it's going really well. It's okay. between Watson's IBM Watson and IBM Blockchain okay. to take patient data uh, for oncology patients in this case okay. and provide a mechanism for securely exchanging it, essentially between the patients and manufacturers and researchers. Mm -hmm. Right, as a test if the blockchain platform could be used you know, to enable this. Right, so yeah. the, uh, yeah. the use case is that manufacturers or researchers would want this data. So by data, I mean uh, electronic medical records, sure. genomic data, clinical trial data, if yeah. applicable, as well as exogenous data. So things like from a Fitbit or weather information, that by taking all this data and tying it to a patient, potentially one that's on their medicine currently, yeah. Right. They could create better outcomes. Yeah. We've seen a lot of that too with pharma, uh, looking at that and saying we really want to find ways to better engage the patients, uh, the users of our products. So how could we be more involved in terms of uh, when everybody talks about health information exchange? It's typically providers sharing information with each other. How can we be involved as part of that broader network? And they look at blockchain as. Is certainly a way to do that, and also ways to provide incentives and ways to provide alerts and messaging uh, directly to patients. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I didn't have any other questions for the panel, but I'd love to hear questions from the audience uh, just in terms of general blockchain, general blockchain supply chain issues uh, that come up. Um, I'm happy to take some questions at this point. We certainly have some, some interesting, diverse viewpoints here uh, that we can share. Sir. The, the question was, in terms of a recall, how would you identify uh, individual uh, medicinal models? So this is where these two processes come together. So the API, the manufacturing process, ends when you have created essentially a sellable unit, which think of it as a bottle or a blister pack. Uh, the DCSA process begins when you bind a serial number, a unique identifier, to that package. Right, so you would determine, be able to determine if some ingredient was contaminated, which cell, which package it went into, and through the serial number then, where that package went. And I'll follow up a little bit on that as well. Um, so 
what I'll, what I'll try to say is a lot of the blockchain itself is not the solution. Yeah. It's the underlining technology that can track and trace the product. So that may be serialization. That may be something you know most of you are familiar with RFID, radio frequency identifiers. Yeah. You have to affix that to the package. So if there's an adverse event, and this is why you know the metadata is important when you're mining data as far as whether there's an adverse event. If there's a cluster of adverse events, you can associate or correlate whether there is a lot of product that is associated with that adverse event. And then you can backtrack and look whether where that lot was dispensed to. Now, if the RFID tags are specific to a product, to an individual you know, unit, then it's easy to figure out the dispensing. But that also ties into the blockchain design itself. Because right now, I think a lot of the blockchain designs in pharma are about private blockchains across supplier networks. They're not about touching the end user. Yeah. Because then you get into privacy issues with PHI, et cetera, exactly. when you're talking about tracking and tracing all the way back to the patient which is good for recall purposes, but may be hard from a compliance perspective. So what you could see is a private blockchain of a supplier network where the only thing you get to is the dispenser, and then you use the dispenser records to identify. To exactly. Yeah. It's, it's still a lot more efficient than relying on Stericycle to contact every single patient and get your recall you know, batch numbers back and make sure you have 80% you know, of your recalls back. That's a really expensive process. Yeah. So if you had, and then plus, the blockchain provides you an, an immutable audit, audit trail. So the audit trail alone is of a high value. So effectuating the recall is, not, is, is tied into the design of the blockchain itself. It's, they're not independent. Yeah. So that's guess what we're trying to say. And I would add to that, um, you, know, you gave a great example with, with uh, blockchain and AI with Watson. Uh, certainly uh, with work, work that we've done, blockchain and IoT. So we talk about this Internet of Things. It's this concept everybody talks about all the time. But it actually is out there. You actually see smart medicinal bottles. You see smart pills. You see that ability to use sensory technologies now. And it's real stuff. I mean, there are actually smart pills out there where you can track exactly to ingestion where something goes. Hmm. Uh, so um, this is an example, I think, also, like you were mentioning with the, the DSCSA, they write a law and technology, they didn't think of that when they were writing it, but technology now is caught up and almost surpassed now in terms of the regulatory language. Now we really can start to, to implement a lot of those uh, specific policies um, with the technology that we have in place now and the cost point that it's at. Other questions? Yes. Scream. I'm sure we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry, and I'm losing my voice anyway. That's okay. Um, I, I'm Jennifer Hinkle. I'm a consultant uh, working with a lot of biotech and pharma companies. And I was wondering what thoughts you have about not only the uh, physical supply chain track and trace, but using um, blockchain or related uh, kind of systems to, to do the government price reporting, 340B tracking, you know, all of this kind of it, it seems that maybe this would open up the door for like pricing by indication. So I'm kind of curious as to like the financial part and how you guys maybe see that fitting in or don't. You want to start? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, you're spot on. 340B in particular is an area of interest for blockchain where we believe and the government believes blockchain could help. Right. So the, the price matching uh, for 340B and for other kind of rebate programs that are in place. And for it to be fully effective, right, it would tie to the supply chain piece so you know exactly where, which shipment, which lot of drug went where, as well as, you know, back to the piece uh, as to whether the, um, the medication is being dispensed to patients who aren't eligible for 340B, right? There was just, Congress was holding hearings on this, I think, last month because they view the program as being um, facing extreme challenges right now, let's say. And IBM is advocating that they at least consider pilots using blockchain to help make the program run more efficiently. So the, it's, a great, it's a great use case, yeah. Yeah, I agree. We, we work on a pilot now in that 340B space um, because Pharma has identified that specifically as an issue um, where they see rebate processing as being a, a way to use blockchain use it in the way it was designed, what, it, what it's uh, really intended for. So, any thoughts, Tim? You were shaking your head, so. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I guess, you know, my experience with, you know, working with partners in pharma, especially on the security side, has been that, you know, any type of pricing, even in the aggregations, 
is hard to get, you know, disclosed. So yeah. it may be a good use case in discrete areas like 340B, but in the context of, you know, could you allow more, you know, uh, value-added healthcare where it was based on, you know, looking at the pricing and the health econ associated with it. I think that's going to be a hard pull for, for pricing yeah. data to get into the it's blockchain. It's a great example. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's just my personal opinion, but mm -hmm. I do think that we were talking a little bit about other, you know, data points as well. Uh, Bill was mentioning that. Um, uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about is pharmacogenomics data and how if you have, you know, personalized data, a lot of pharmacogenomics testing is out there. That's controversial, the DTC, direct-to-consumer genomics testing market. Mm -hmm. But if you have a pharmacogenomics test that you take, and you own that because it's your consumer data, and then you're able to share that on a blockchain, and that's going to optimize what uh, medicines that uh, are utilized for your clinical care. That could, you know, liberalize some of the components of whether you would have more precision-based medicine approaches to prescribing. So that's a kind of a mirror of, you know, consumer data that could be liberalized through a blockchain, plus, you know, supply chain metrics that could be added to that. Yeah. Um, so I see that as a better space than pricing, personally, for performance. I agree. Uh, I agree. But, you know, that's an open discussion. Yeah, yeah we're getting a lot in the, the payer space as well with blockchain. Um, there, there's a natural tendency to think that blockchain could work very well in terms of disclosing, uh, disclosing information such as provider payment rates or disclosing information. Um, certainly one pilot we've done with uh, a process called shared accumulators um, and who pays what as part of a claim. But it's a tremendous lift, even if they're perceived as being anonymous as part of a blockchain network, to share that type of pricing information, um, even in a, in, with an established network of trust, where they know somebody's not going to know who they are. The fact that everybody could see it, uh, I think, is a, a big concern still that they have to work through. Question, sir. I think, I think there could be. You know, it's interesting when we talk about uh, authenticity of medicines. So outside of the U.S., it's, much, it's a much greater yeah, challenge than in. And outside of the U.S., there are experiments going on with things like that, right? So giving consumers or customers an app that they could somehow use, scan something or photograph mm -hmm. something on a bottle of medicine, be over-the-counter medicine or prescription medicine, to verify it. And that's an opt-in process. Uh, that's being experimented with. In the US, interestingly, what you're describing, it's much easier to do that on the animal health side. Right? So you think animal health, it's the same challenges as people health, right? but it's less controlled, uh, a less regulated environment. So doing that to incent consumers to you know, somehow self-identify or opt into this network, be it a blockchain network or something else, you would, as a manufacturer of animal health products, you, know, you would be able to, through that, connect with the consumer. So you get kind of the holy grail, which is a manufacturer connecting with a consumer endpoint by giving them some incentive to you know, opt in, scan the product, uh, and that gives them access to either authenticate it or get some content. You know, so in the US, I see that moving much yeah. more quickly on the animal health side. Yeah. And I'll follow up on that as well. Uh, so um, what Mark was talking about is generally referred to as M pedigree, which is mobile pedigree, and it's used in a lot of developing countries such as Nigeria and, and Kenya where they have medicines problems and essentially like, you know, you scan the barcode on the product and then it goes back to a manufacturer's cloud database and verifies whether that medicine is legitimate or not. At least it's within the authentic batch. So that IoT device can then feed into a blockchain and act as kind of a public health surveillance component at the consumer level if the consumer wants to opt in for that and they have some incentive to do so. Um, so, but you can also add existing data. There's, I mean, people tweet about things all the time now and 
So what my research group does is we mine a lot of Twitter data, and there's groups that do it for adverse event reporting, looking at people talking about whether they've had an adverse event and they can identify the drug. So there's a lot of secondary data available. We use it primarily to identify prescription drug abuse and uh, gray markets that are selling prescription uh, controlled substances online illegally. Um, so there's a lot of data available there. And then I also think there's other ways to map incentives. Like, luckily, I'm an academic, so I don't have to think about commercialization. <laughs> You're I one just of have them, to huh? think about <laughs> policy. Well, blockchain <laughs> academics. So. <laughs> but um, one of the, another interesting you know, idea is you know, uh, we have a lot of fraud and abuse in the country. Mm -hmm. And we have key TAM laws that incentivize whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have a matrix that allows a key TAM realtor to receive a payment associated with a whistleblowing through a Bitcoin or something like that, and it would be verified. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to do uh, syndromic surveillance, yep. also, you know, citizens, you know, surveillance, I guess you could call it, in ways that the blockchain could incentivize. It's not going to tell you exactly what's happening, but I think it will provide more resolution to what's going on. And that's mm -hmm. why the layers of data are important. Yeah, and, and I would just add with the, the incentive piece, um, like with a lot of things in blockchain, there is a startup that's doing something in that space. So they, they came up with this concept of health coin. So don't go out and buy it. You're not going to be a millionaire with that. But um, the idea is if you share your data, we'll give you something as an incentive. So whether that's a token, whether that's uh, some type of discount, um, I know uh, Pharma has talked about discounts on medications, rebates on medications directly to the consumer, uh, or even just depositing money in an HSA, for example. Um, so they've looked at that already as a pilot working with the startup to say, how can we incentivize directly through financial incentive uh, to allow for um, individuals as patients to have control of their data, actually share it, literally sell it uh, for some type of incentive. Other questions, thoughts? Okay, we are uh, done in about five minutes. So if you have any questions for uh, any of the panelists up here, we'd be happy to stay a little longer uh, and answer those. Thank you everybody.